Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Doc Real Talk podcast. My name is Agnieszka Janarek, and I'm your host. Today's guest is Michael Shikashio. And although many of you will probably consider Michael a specialist on aggression, we talked about something different. We talked about stray dogs and dogs in general and different cultures because Michael travels a lot and he has seen many different cultures and how they perceive dog in everyday life how dogs behave in different cultures, how dogs, what is the place of a dog in various cultures. And I think it's a really interesting topic and a wonderful insight into the everyday life of dogs in different places. I hope you will enjoy this episode. Let us know in comments or emails or private messages. What are your thoughts after listening to it? Enjoy. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, really glad you made it. Um, I would love to talk to you about various culture, dog cultures and how people approach dogs in various countries because I know this is something you're interested in and you've been traveling all around the world, meeting people and dogs and seeing how people treat dogs and how, what relationship they built with dogs in various countries. Yes, uh, two of my favorite topics, definitely. I, I, I've been to, I think, seven different countries in the last uh, year and a half or so. So I've been uh, uh, enjoying seeing the different cultures, especially the trainers, the training culture and the, the professionals working with dogs. So it's been a lot of fun meeting uh, mm -hmm. uh, different uh, people in terms of how they view training or how they how they approach uh, working with dogs. It's It, it can vary uh, uh, greatly by country, I'm mm -hmm. sure, as you're aware. So. Yeah. Okay, and how do you see how people approach dog training in general in various countries? Is it something popular in one country that mostly everyone goes to a dog school and in other country, it's more like uh, something unusual and rarely happens? I think it's part of, uh, there's parts of each of that equation. So I think with the online and the, the web, it's it's created this wonderful access to um, seeing other types of methods and techniques, especially things like YouTube have really, I think, elevated uh, just the knowledge of dog behavior and training in general all across the world. Um, I've seen, I've met trainers in say Mexico or Colombia or in other areas of the world where they have access now to um, people like uh, Kiko Pup or um, you know some of the other well-known Nando Brown and people like that that are well-known in the on, on that ch platform, uh, they have access where they may have never gotten that before. So I think um, some of that is definitely creeped into those cultures. But I also find that there's they have their individual lens that they kind of view things through. So here in the states, um, there's much more of a concentration on applied behavior analysis. Mm -hmm. Um, and kind of viewing behavior through that lens. But I've found that in some of the other countries, they might view it more through a medical model or maybe an ethological model. Um, sort of, uh, you, know, you know, Roger Abrantes is very popular in some countries and um, he approaches things from the ethology side of things. So I see that uh, certainly playing a role. And that's where sort of everybody seems to gravitate towards if that's like the main thing in their, in their country. So... Yeah. Okay. And yes, a ABA, it's like uh, definitely in the States. And I think also in the UK, it's getting more popular. Yes. Uh, so English speaking countries, but also I noticed that in Poland, what you said, it's interesting because in Poland, many people focus on ethology mostly. It's like, mm -hmm. this is the main, uh, the main lens. They look at the training and how, how does it relate to, um, when you travel and meet all those trainers and people involved with dogs, how does it relate to the pet owners, pet dog owners, and how they uh, work with dogs and how they live with dogs? Is Does it vary from place to place? Definitely, definitely. Um, it's, I think, 
more so the it's not so much the behavior i think it's the lifestyle that is more affecting behavior so i don't think as you know the typical pet owner is not really concentrating on applied behavior analysis yeah. or ornithology we, we translate for for them um but there i think the culture it affects the behavior the most so how the dogs are um, um taken care of how much free access they have to the environment to the to the real world so to speak um, I think that 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 can have such an impact on behavior. And what I've seen in in uh, you know in the states here, it's, there's such restrictions on uh, access to the outdoor world and um, leash. You know, we have our leash laws and and um, making sure dogs are always on leash or contained. Or uh, and some some owners will just um, have their dogs in their home all day and they get very little access to the outside world. Versus some of the other countries like Mexico, where there's there's many street dogs and many, it's mm -hmm. just common to have sort of this access to the world. Uh, so I think that uh, is playing a significant role mm -hmm. uh, in the overall uh, behavior picture, so to speak. Okay. And you said like in Mexico, for example, there are so many stray dogs. And I, I wonder if it also relates to the fact how we treat aggression, which is another your really main topic. And because uh, I was thinking that maybe if, the dogs are allowed more freely in the in the common space, and the approach to aggression has to be a little different than in a place in the countries like the states. I think so. I think there are some similarities, though. You'll see things like uh, dogs that guard their resources. That's going to be fairly universal. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think that, and I think the treatment plan would be fairly universal if you if you're applying uh, applied behavior analysis model to it um, I do think the leash uh, issues are much different mm -hmm. so dogs on leash versus off leash uh, you don't see those th as the frequency of um, quote-unquote reactive behavior yeah. in places like Mexico as you would here in the states it's almost um so it's almost an epidemic portion <laughs> sort of uh, level right now in the states where it's just that's a very common behavior um it's keeping many trainers in business i think so uh versus in in mexico i didn't see much of that there was the, although the interesting thing was the dogs a lot of the dogs that i did see that were on leash were the reactive ones the ones that were off leash were there's no reaction at all in fact they were just very uh, they would be good demo or decoy dogs for the working with reactive dogs i think so i think that's that's one of the things i see with the differences in working with you know so quote unquote aggressive behavior um i think that the toleration level is also different for uh for dogs that bite in some of those other countries they don't they don't generally last too long if they are biting are dangerous i think we're much more uh, uh there's a lot of the save them all culture here and so that can be where they put expend enormous amounts of resources and time um you know, in the effort to try to save a dog that might have a high level bite history mm -hmm. or has severely injured people or other dogs at that there's, there's a higher level of tolerance uh, for that here. So in the States. Yes. Oh, yes. That's interesting because I thought it's going to be the other way around that in the States, the, um, there is not much tolerance and in other countries like maybe Mexico, for example, when we have uh, straight dogs, as an example, uh, it's more more acceptable for the dog to be aggressive. I think, well, I think if you look, if you look at the extremes, I think um, in Mexico, for instance, if a dog bites, it's, I think that at least from my understanding is that when they, that happens, it's sort of like, you know, what was the person doing wrong? Um, or, you know, it's just like, kind of you know 20 years ago here in the states if, if you got bitten it was always you know what were you doing wrong or did you pet the dog while it's eating and don't do that again and that's how we raised our kids back then and now it's much different it's it's there's a lot more blame placed on the dog there's mm -hmm. um you know uh or the person sometimes but it's it, i think it's the how the the culture surrounding that particular dog so if it's a rescue or there's a lot of people get involved with saving that one dog Mm -hmm. then they can have a much higher tolerance level in that regard. So I think because you have the extreme, on the other end of the extreme here, you have the, the lawsuits that happen so easily here. People get sued when their dog bites. And so um, there's that awareness of that. But um, 
I find with things like social media and, you know, the culture of somebody posts a dog that may have bitten somebody very severely, but everybody wants to save that dog. So surely they can work with a trainer. Surely they can um, spend time and money and fix the problem because they, they, they don't want to uh, see anything worse happen for that dog. So I think, um, I don't think there's that kind of tolerance in some of the other countries where a, da a dangerous dog is going to be continually held and, and sheltered. In fact, I have a, a, uh, I'm aware of a case where the dog has bitten at a level five on the Dunbar bite scale, which is a highly damaging bite, uh, multiple bites usually. And it's been in the sort of the shelter environment being kind of shifted from shelter to shelter for the last three years. I mean, so that's a, that's an extreme where you're just, you know, you're, you're kind of moving the dog from one place to the other to in, the, in an effort to try to save the dog, but nobody's really gotten ownership of the dog. So, mm -hmm. yes. And I, because you said that the interesting thing was you said that like 20 years ago, we were thinking like, what happened? What were you doing when the bite happened? And yes. this was more like, don't you think that it was more like, normal and natural for the dog to perform some aggressive behaviors that the dog can bite so we have to do things to avoid the biting and it's not like this is so weird the dog bites <laughs> right i think and it's you know it's, it was more understood back then um or there was and also on the house again on the other side of the coin they you know you would the, the, the solution for it was to take the dog out to the back and, and shoot them you know in the old days that was the sort of the solution but uh yeah it was also you know hey what were you doing and and so now there's this sort of expectation that you can just do any you should be able to do anything with dogs and they should never bite i find that culture a lot uh at least with in, in a lot of areas and of course that's not with everybody but that seems to be more of the general uh, shift in the, the view view of dogs here but there are some countries have you noticed maybe that have still more this type this old type of approach this i'm sorry the bold yeah, type of approach old type of approach oh, old in type. terms of like what we said that the dog what, what are you doing when the bite happened are there still countries and cultures that are more willing to uh, explain the situation, not because the dog was um, mean that bit you. I think so. I think, um, you know, especially where dogs are more um, common in the public environment. So street dogs, uh, dogs that are just out and about, and you know, I, I've always compared them to like watching pigeons in Central Park here in, New, in the States is New York, the Central Park and the pigeons are just all over the place and nobody pays attention to them because they're everywhere and they're not a big deal. And mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of similar there. They're just everywhere and people just, they could be literally sleeping right on the sidewalk and people just step over them. They don't try to interact or pet the dog or try to get the dog's attention. They're just literally hundreds of people just stepping over the dog <laughs> while sleeping in the middle of a busy sidewalk. And that's, that's the normal there um, uh, versus, versus here, where sometimes if somebody sees a dog in, in a public cafe or something, it's just such a, everybody wants to come up and pet it. Can I pet your dog? Or they just come up and pet the dog or they're staring at it. <laughs> um, so I think that, that there's those differences for sure. And do you think those differences, if we would be beneficial, if it would be beneficial to take a little bit of those cultures and how they treat, for example, stray dogs? and in a public spaces to our more uh, contained uh, approach. Yes, I think if, you know, if you look at, and I think it was John Rogerson that was talking about it at one point where he's been to some of the European countries where there's so much free access for dogs to just go anywhere. They travel in public transportation, they're on the streets and they sort of can even roam from, from neighbor to neighbor. Um, and, it, and there's no, there's, literally zero aggression. There's very little aggressive behavior because the dog is so well socialized and so adapted to the environment. And um, it's just normal, those, those mm -hmm. sort of normal everyday routines. And the behavior of the humans too is becomes not so erratic, I guess, for some dogs where it's mm -hmm. people are just coming right up to their face and trying to give them a kiss or... Mm -hmm. Or a hand. Understand. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <I've seen your laughs> <post>. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the magical hand to yeah. come sniff. They don't. They, you don't see that in the culture. So uh, I think that that um, you know that mm -hmm. particular access to the public certainly plays a role for for dog behavior. So. 
So dogs become more common in the public space and people are more used to them and they don't behave like this is some kind of a, um, because I think like in our culture a little bit, uh, people treat dogs in the public space as a public good that you can go and touch and, and mm -hmm. uh, interact with and sometimes don't ask the, the, the owner even. And because in, at least in Poland right now, I have, I haven't seen for like years a dog running freely without like the stray dogs. They, they, they were here years ago, but right now, even in the countryside, you won't see a stray dog. So people are not used to them right now. Right. And it's the same here. It's, like, it's kind of the polar opposite, especially if you start getting into some of the uh, suburban neighborhoods near the cities. Uh, here, so on the east coast of the United States, and where New York and Boston, that sort of um, area of New England, it, it's it's very very rare to see any kind of stray dog. In fact, if you do see one, people will literally come out in droves to save that dog, and they'll make this huge effort and call out the national guard to try to capture this dog because surely it must be lost and it must be <laughs> abandoned, uh, and not just a dog that's out living on the streets or um you know running around it clearly somebody must have lost it so they have to save it and, and it's it's the complete opposite extreme again if you go to uh colombia or mexico or, or somewhere where there's 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 just street dogs everywhere it's just such a interesting contrast to me to see yeah. that and those street dogs i mean do you see can we say it's good it's like because this is a controversial topic because uh i guess the medical care is an issue here but on the other hand, what is better, being kept in a crate for a whole day or being on the street and doing whatever you want? Right. I think, um, I think there's, there's, a, there's a balance in there somewhere that, that, you know, surely we can't just allow, especially now that there's all these laws and we can't just tomorrow let all of the dogs start running free. Um, but I think there could be certainly more... Um, dog-friendly laws put into place, dog-friendly areas. Um, you know, my, my girlfriend, I, we were just talking about this, we, she just moved from Chile and she's so used to having those access to public places. And so she comes here and she starts asking me about the, the beaches here and what uh, where we can take the dog. And I'm like, there's really no place to take the dogs. There's very few options for that, which puts great restrictions. So a lot of people don't want to travel that 20 minutes to the area where they can let their dog run off leash. Um, you know, we have our, we have our dog parks here, mm -hmm. which are, uh, um, I'm not a big fan of dog parks and that's a topic <laughs> for another day, but that, um, that's what we have here and that can create its own issues. So mm -hmm. I think, um, and, and it's almost like you get this contagious behavior sometimes too. People bring their, um, dog aggressive dog to the dog park to try to socialize it, which then, becomes problematic for the other dogs and so it becomes like this contagious behavior so i think we need much more uh, relaxed laws on where dogs can go restaurants outdoor restaurants mm -hmm. uh, public places public transportation um, things like that can mm -hmm. if that was in place we'd see a little bit better change in the overall behavior i think uh, because you, you certainly don't see that much in the street dogs it's not that street dogs don't display aggression i think there's just such a less, there's such less frequency of it towards people or other dogs Mm -hmm. because it's expensive for them the for, behavior for yes them. yes absolutely yes um it, it's they, they risk a lot um mm -hmm. you know but and again you also have to balance as you mentioned the medical side of things the medical care um we see that's the side of things that that um that is difficult to see in some of the other countries you know you have street dogs of course they're not getting getting the proper veterinary care um and so that can kind of make it where you start shifting the culture towards the other end where you start adopting all dogs and contain dogs and getting the right veterinary care. So um, so I think that's part of it. And of course, the population loss, Spain, neutering, um, you know, so that's the other consideration. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't have, I don't know if I have any kind of right answer at all for any yeah, kind of solution. Like to middle ground should be like the best yeah. thing we could do. And uh, because, can we say that some of the aggressive behaviors that we can see in uh, in the public space and the in what people struggle with their dogs is because of how we live with the, the with the dogs and how we um, how we handle them in the public spaces and 
what they are allowed to do. Yeah, absolutely. I think crating is a big one. Um, I, I believe it was Spain, where I was just in Spain, where crating is almost unheard of. Um, and I know many of the European countries, nobody crates their dogs. It's almost like, why would you crate your dog? It's, um, we it's, have crates. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, but it's not, it's like, it's getting popular. Uh, a lot of people start to crate their dogs, but it's more like when you travel with a dog to a seminar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, I think dogs should be used to crates, but I think they're highly overused. Oh. Especially here in the States. Um, you know, I've, I've gone to clients' homes and the dog is, you know, four years old and they're still using a crate. And I, I'll ask, you know, what's the reason for it? They're like, well, that's just what he's used to or he likes it. And um, it's, you know, it's there. I think they're overused here and they're, they're certainly used in aggression cases for containment a lot. So, and that's a lot of the, with aggressive dogs, they, they suffer from what lack of enrichment because the dog's owner is putting the dog away, they're keeping away from the public, they're going for, for less walks, they're mm -hmm. exposing the dog less to uh, because they're worried about the dog's aggressive behavior, which is understandable. Mm -hmm. But then what happens is you get uh, the dog starts to suffer more and more from an enrichment level, and it just becomes like this this spiral, this sort of... It's like a vicious circle. No. Yes. And um, so, you know, and crating is one of the big problems with that. Mm. It's, it's, it's an easy solution. It's highly reinforcing to the owner most of yeah. the time. <laughs> is the problem in a lot of cases they can just crate the dog when somebody comes over or crate the dog when no one's home okay so like oh, the dog is all the time in the crate and it's closed right. Right? i mean it's, it's locked yes okay yes. oh wow so yeah th this doesn't happen really often here in poland we have more like as i told you that if you go to a seminar if you travel uh it's a good option uh to to have a space for your dog where he can go and rest but it's usually the crate is open so that's a different thing. But so creating an enrichment, and enrichment also means going out. Right. <laughs> well, just, you know, solitary confinement is probably one of the worst things that can happen to any mammal, any social species. Yeah. And so that's what they're suffering from often is just this, this solitary confinement. They're in a crate, you know, 12, 15 hours a day and, and very little exposure to anybody else but their owner. I mean, think about how that impacts behavior, not only from um, the enrichment level, but also when the dog finally does see somebody, <laughs> how much of a big yeah. event it is. Absolutely. And do you think that this is also because the, the owners, they are afraid to go to public. They are maybe ashamed very often of, uh, of what the dog may do, barking, lunging. And because of the restrictive laws and how people look at the aggression in the public space, this is like so difficult to solve. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's part of our jobs as trainers and behavior consultants. We have to teach the clients how to set up the you know, environment or control their, their distance from those trigger stimuli to uh, work with their dog's behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a, uh, obviously a big part of it. But yes, you can see how a lot of clients feel sort of helpless because they have no, they've really come, come to just a few options for what they can do with their dog. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And going back a little to the various cultures, is that the different approach also applies to um, rescue dogs and how people, uh, how the shelter even look like in various countries? Yes, yes. I think um, we have our micro cultures here in the United States. So, you know, it's a big country. And so we have a lot of dogs being shipped up from the southern states and they're culture is even a little bit different than the northern states mm -hmm. as far as how they work with and view dogs their shelters are much more uh, overcrowded um, the enrichment incorporated enrichment is much less now this is just kind of a generalization of course there's plenty of wonderful shelters and um, programs in the south but some of the more rural areas um, there's mm -hmm. it's certainly different in terms of how the dogs are treated, how the dogs are confined, how many dogs are allowed in there. Um, and so they, they ship a lot of these dogs up north because there's, they're overcrowding in the south. In some of the shelters up here in the north, there's actually not enough dogs. There's, I've been to some wow. shelters where it's, they've got 20 runs and they've got one dog with a 
with a full staff and a whole board of directors and everything. And they're, they're wow. <laughs> dogs. So they, that's where they get them from. They ship them up in the South. And it becomes like this sort of underground railroad almost of dogs where they're just <laughs> shipping dogs up the North and even in Canada. Uh, but there's problems with that, though. There's, mm. there's problems are is that you're getting dogs that are sight unseen being ad adopted by owners. They don't know. They see a great picture on, on the Internet of a dog, a cute picture taken, but they have no idea about the dog's behavior history or what the dog's behavior is like. They're doing they have very little information even down there in the south where they're shipping these dogs from. They might have 50 or 60 or 100 dogs in a shelter environment or somebody's home. Okay. In some cases, and there's very little information about the, the yeah. dogs. So you're getting a lot of these dogs that do have aggressive behavior tendencies to come up to the north, and that's where I see a lot of that happening. So you get these, these sort of microcultures of mm -hmm. dogs in those shelters. One of the interesting things I've seen is that dogs that don't know how to use stairs, so they come uh. up here. And the reason why is because there's a lot of single-level homes in the south. Wow. Are. Where they're in a kennel where it's just single level. They come up north and they're deathly afraid to use the stairs because they've never seen stairs before. So that's it's just shows you how much culture can affect a dog's behavior and what they're what they perceive as safe and not safe. Absolutely. Um, and why is it that in the north you have so little dogs in the shelter? Is it the policy of the shelter? Is it the the culture? I think it's the, um, the the awareness of spaying and neutering and population control. I think um, most people now are rescuing dogs or, or adopting dogs from rescues or shelters rather than purchasing from breeders. Oh, really? Um, yes, that's the sort of the right thing to do for a lot of the culture mm -hmm. here. And I'm there's I'm just want to say it. I'm not. There's I have nothing against breeders or good breeding. Certainly, there's wonderful breeders and good breeding programs out there. I think, but I think the culture is all here is to adopt mm -hmm. instead of instead mm -hmm. of um, purchasing from a breeder. So, I think that has helped with a lot of the population mm -hmm. uh, problems up here, and uh, I, I just there's actually a lack of supply in some in some cases. Um, so they will again go to the south. They'll contact their rescues and ship some dogs up on a transport. Um, the transports are very common. They'll come up to a, meet all of the adopters at some big parking lots here in, in Connecticut. And then they all the adopters again, their dogs pretty much sight unseen. They've just seen a picture or have very little information. So uh, it's okay. So. Yeah, this is very interesting. It's like it doesn't happen here in Poland. It's very often like every shelter is probably crowded in Poland. Uh, and uh, we have some great shelters and amazing um, people working there. But uh, the problem of uh, overcrowded shelter is really huge. And it doesn't matter what side of the country you are. Obviously, Poland is much smaller than the States. But still, uh, it's like the general problem in our country. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. And uh, I want to ask you about whether you think that because this is becoming popular to adopt stray dogs to rescue stray dogs. Yes. Uh, it's like in Poland, people uh, sometimes go uh, for a holiday to Greece or um, somewhere where stray dogs culture is, is popular. And they see a dog on the street, probably not perfectly taken care of in terms of medical uh, issues. And they want to bring the dog back to Poland and to adapt it to a new life at home. Do you think this is something we should be doing? Is it good for the dog? I think it's, um, I think it's an it depends question. Um, so I think some dogs can be very resilient to that kind of change in environment. So they, you know, they, they leave their home territory or their home in that country and they move to a different country i think it can be beneficial especially if they're suffering from some sort of medical issue that that person can address at home uh, in their country it's i think that's reasonable um however i think it's unreasonable to take truly feral or street dogs that have never had an owner mm -hmm. and expecting them to fit into a certain lifestyle here or wherever the home is um, because these dogs are again if we look at the the environment and how much that plays a role in behavior you know you have these street dogs that are just used to having all of this freedom and um, they can become really good at um, 
and adapting to that environment versus somebody bringing them home, um, you know, home the to city. a yeah. Yeah, big city uh, where they're not used to all those um, sounds and sights and um, restrictions on movement. It can be very, very stressful for some dogs. And you'll see, um, you know, what's, then you have to kind of ask yourself the question, what's worse for that dog? The, mm -hmm. the welfare of Ford's health or the welfare of Ford's behavior? Yeah. And so if we take a dog that was perfectly happy, maybe a little bit of a skin issue or something going on, and we bring them here, and then they're suffering um, greatly because of the enormous impact on their mm -hmm. overall mental welfare uh, because they're not they're completely um, um, over overstimulated or overstressed by that new environment mm -hmm. so I think that should be always taken into consideration in that it depends question yeah um, absolutely. So, Yes, absolutely. Because it's like if a medical thing is an issue, then maybe yes, you're right. It's it should be addressed. But uh, often those dogs, the stray dogs, uh, when you have time to observe them, I guess uh, that they have a very social behavior. Many social behaviors our dogs lack because uh, they had to develop it. They had to develop the the various behavior communication. Otherwise, they wouldn't survive. Yes, I've seen some amazing communication skills in the dogs, the street dogs. Uh, by far, they, they just, you know, here they, the dogs, when they're on leash with, and they see another dog, sometimes they have to really scream out loud, barking, lunging, and, and telling the other dog to go away. The street dogs, there's some of them, it's just, it's as subtle as just a, I'm going to lift my head and the other dog's like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm invading your space. I'll just keep on moving. And that's it. There's no need to escalate to any levels of aggression because, as you mentioned, it's very expensive behavior. Uh, but it's also, it's all they need to do to communicate. And they, they do it really well. They learn, mm -hmm. learn at a young age. They also learn how to really... Um, pick out the right tourists to get food from. <laughs> um, I saw some, some kind of have over, overweight dogs in some of the countries because they're really good at scavenging and getting uh, food from the tourists. <laughs> uh, do you think we could use or would be too dangerous? Because when you, when, when you say that they are so good in communication, is it possible to use the stray dogs as, uh, as teachers for our dogs? or it would be too risky to arrange a situation? I think that if you found, if you got a little data on those <laughs> the street dogs that you planned on using for, um, yeah. uh, for work, but um, I, think, I think it's unavoidable in some countries. I mean, if you're a dog trainer in, in Chile or Mexico, you're gonna, it's, it's part of the program. It's hard to avoid those dogs. So just becoming used to knowing what to do. Um, but most of those dogs aren't gonna, Come up to the, the the leashed dog unless they're getting into their space or their territory and so um but i think i think the trainers in those countries are definitely aware of what to do in those circumstances if they're working with uh, a dog their client's dog yeah. like that absolutely and very often you go back to a leash topic which is i think from what you say one of the biggest factor that influences aggressive behavior and how people handle leash and yeah. how, how this uh, how it changes the interaction because stray dogs and um, they are living freely and no one uses leashes so it doesn't change the how they communicate and our dogs have to learn it absolutely uh i you know the, the problem with, with leashes from what i see is um it's they restrict movement greatly. Mm -hmm. So you, when you, when you, anytime you restrict the movement, you're taking away either the dog's flight option. So if they're scared of something and they want to move away, um, you remove the flight option. You're left with one of the other F's and fights is one of the common ones we see. I also see um, frustration being um, kind of fueling the, the behavior. So the dog is either trying to, again, get to or away from something and they, they get more and more frustrated. And when the owners typically what they do is they get more controlling of the leash. So they tighten up on the leash and they're holding the leash tight. And then it becomes this pattern. They start to expect it. They see another dog and then the owner holds the leash tight and then the dog comes. And so it's, it becomes like this pattern. And in fact, I've seen it many times where the clients become the cue for the dog behavior because they hold the leash tight and it's as if to say, okay, I'm 
leash is getting tight and I'm tensing up, that means it's, it's time for you to start reacting towards yeah. the other dog because the leash is tight. Um, so leashes can be horribly restricted, uh, restrictive and used often in the wrong ways. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the things I focus on most is, is good loose leash handling mechanics mm -hmm. when working with clients. It's so important if you want to um, address that kind of uh, sort of reactive behavior on leash. Yes, because people, what they often do also is like during the interaction, the dog may, might have been able to go away from it, but then suddenly the owner just grabs the leash, tightens the leash, mm -hmm. and it explodes. Yes, yeah. And, and think about it this way too. Say, say you have a dog that is um, maybe showing some signs to the owner of distress around so they take the dog to a public cafe and the leash is nice and loose the owner's having their cup of coffee or their tea and then somebody approaches or the little child approaches or another dog approaches the owner tries to be proactive and so they grab the leash and they're holding it tight or they're whole or worse they're holding the dog by the collar or the harness and not even using the leash at all i think about like how how awful that is for that particular dog because now they're like saying okay Instead of I want to be able to move away from this child or other dog, you're going to kind of force me to be mm -hmm. into that interaction. And it's just the owner not realizing it, but they're, they're, they're trying to be proactive and prevent anything that might happen. Um, yeah. so. so, yes, because what you said that leash restricts movement. And if we look at the stray dogs, they are absolutely free to move as they want. And mm -hmm. they don't need to be, they're not pushed to interaction, right? It doesn't, it doesn't happen there. Generally speaking, you know, the, I think the only time it does happen is when that uh, somebody encroaches on their territory or their space oh, yeah. and they don't mm -hmm. want it, uh, or we push them into an area where they can't escape from, mm -hmm. uh, certainly, yeah. But in the most regular interaction between the, the group of dogs, they usually can go away, move a third away, uh, and... Uh, with a leash, we absolutely, yes, we, we restrict it. And we also force very often our dogs to have this just so limited communication on a small space. Absolutely. Yeah, it's so restrictive. And uh, yeah, it's, I think one of the skills that should be taught right away to your clients is how to ensure that that leash is kept loose, you know. Mm. So, and it's a foreign topic for a lot of clients because they're so like you want me to keep it loose not tight instead of worrying about what the dog's about to do so yes and loose loose leash skills or it's like this is something everyone wants because you don't want a dog that pulls on the leash but on the other hand we don't train we don't work for it in a difficult situations because in a difficult situation we usually like we panic <laughs> and we try to get away from the situation and we usually make it worse, as you said. Yes, yeah, definitely. So leash handling skills is something you work a lot, right, with your clients. Yes. yes, yeah, we focus a lot on that. If that's the problem behavior, if the problem behavior is happening on leash or in context where the dog is on leash, mm -hmm. sometimes I'm not using leashes at all as if it's, okay. you know, it's, it's a, a dog that is um, guarding its food or things like that of course we might, might or might not use leashes at all so and what would be the the outer most because uh leash issues and reactivity on a leash is one of the most common problems you encounter and what would be the outer one um so the case i see probably in my top five is people uh, stranger aggression so people coming to the home um, and the dog getting upset about that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I would say the second in that category is the dogs that are um, aggressive towards other dogs. So that, that's usually on leash. Mm -hmm. um, I also see a lot of intra-household dog, dog aggression cases where the two dogs are fighting in the home. Um, Which is then, very difficult. I remember your lecture uh, in Manchester about it and mm -hmm. you described it really so that this is one of the most challenging, especially for the owner. Yes, yes, yeah, because it's kind of a 24-hour problem or mm -hmm. seven days a week because they're living constantly together. And so it's, it's tough to manage versus a case where it's the dog is only going after strangers that come to the home. It's, it's management in those contexts. But mm -hmm. with dogs that live together, it's much different, more stressful for sure for the owner. Yes. So, yeah, it's like mostly what you said right now is, that those uh, 
issues or related, it goes back to limited area and uh, limited um, options for a dog to, to move around uh, because it usually involves leash. Uh, if it's a household, then it's also limited by the walls. And yes. if somebody's coming to the house, a stranger coming to the house, it's also a limiting dog's option. So that's, can we say that this confinement in terms of the boundaries of the walls, of the leash, of the space the dog lives in, is the main issue we should address when working with any aggressive examples of behavior? I think we have to consider it for sure. Mm -hmm. I think, um, I mean, if you look at any, what happens in a, in a typical kennel environment and you're walking by the rows of kennels, how many dogs will start barking or jumping up against those kennels. And that's because again, we're restricting space and we're adding barriers. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, sometimes there's only so much you can do about that though, right? So we yeah. can't just say, all right, let's, we can solve the problem by just letting your dog off leash and run <laughs> around. Sure, we'll have no more leash reactivity, but we don't want to risk that in some cases. And similarly, people entering the home. So we can modify the environment as best we can. So mm -hmm. if it's, for instance, dogs that are aggressive towards people coming in the home, you can you can modify as best you can by starting with the dog way in the other side of the home as the person enters. You're increasing distance as much as possible. Um, you can modify where the dog greets people. Um, you can certainly modify leash handling and um, things like that. And and so we can we can modify the environment to an extent, and we certainly should be aware of it. But unfortunately, we can't always um, make that the single thing to focus on. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, but we can take some, especially uh, do you think it would be beneficial to watch and observe dogs living on the street and how they behave and analyze it and learn from it? Absolutely, I mean, it's fascinating. I spent mm -hmm. uh, one day in Mexico with Sue Sternberg and she's you know really great at observing the micro behaviors of dogs and that was fascinating so I, there's so much to learn by watching those mm -hmm. dogs i think just watching dogs in general of course but just seeing their interactions how they interact with people how they interact with each other mm -hmm. um and what they uh, sort of sort of does elicit aggressive behavior mm -hmm. um and what what you see typically it's over resources there it's it's or in areas with the street dogs it's the dogs are competing over some resource, whether it's uh, the opportunity to mate um, or the um, in, in interesting, um, it was uh, Ray Coppinger and Sue Sternberg, I believe they were um, viewing the dump dogs in Mexico. And the thing that they competed over was um, shade of all things, oh. because such a limited access to cool shady spots versus the, there's plenty of food because it's a yeah. dump. Um, water was generally available, but the, the shade, shady wow. spots, was the thing they compete over. So very fascinating. You can learn so much just by observing um, dogs or, or you know, hearing other stories of dogs in other countries. It's, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the, the shade thing, it's really interesting because it's like this is not what you would think, uh, the first thing you would, uh, you would consider as a resource issue. It's like better, mm -hmm. we all think about food if it comes to resource. Right. Yeah. Hey. It's, if there's plenty of it, then there's no need to compete over it. And uh, if there's lack of it, they're gonna, yeah. they're gonna have problems. So um, yeah, it's, it's 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 interesting what the what the dogs will actually compete over. No, absolutely, and uh, it's I think that watching dogs, not only stray dogs, but as you said, every dog, and we have access to YouTube, and we can watch various videos just to even analyze the behavior and analyze how dogs. Uh, interact and we can really learn from it. It's not just, um, maybe it's not the only source of knowledge and it shouldn't be, but it gives us a lot of possibility because not everyone can travel to Mexico, to Chile, to, to countries where the straight dog culture uh, is, uh, is visible, but there are definitely some videos on the internet. Absolutely, I, I, and I always joke to my students, you know, if you're bored, go on YouTube and just, <laughs> search for dog biting or dogs biting because um, biting is pretty universal. It's a universal language for dogs. So, um, but it really gives you good 
um, insight into the precursors for aggression, mm -hmm. so the subtle signs that might come before a bite, uh, and the circumstances and environment involved, mm -hmm. um, sort of the antecedents for those um, in this, the sort of um, what, what the environment is set for that actual bite to happen. I, I think that's a great way to learn yeah. um, how to avoid getting bitten, number one, but also um, to observe, you know, those subtle precursors in the mm -hmm. environment, getting good at what's, what's really causing the dog's behavior. Absolutely. And you said how to avoid being bitten. This is also interesting for me because I think that years ago, people were more aware that if the dog was on someone's property, there was a possibility that the dog might bite you if you entered the property or you wouldn't really try to pet another dog on somebody's property. And right now I see at least in Poland, many, uh, children being bitten because they don't know how to interact with a dog and right. this is a big issue thing and I think do you, I, I think that maybe this is not such a big issue in the countries where you have stray dogs because people have to be used to how to you know live around them yeah and you think about how much those stray dogs teach the children you know? yeah. and, right because they're there since the kids are growing up and they, they learn how to interact properly with dogs versus some other areas where maybe the children don't get much exposure to dogs at a young age because they're maybe their parents don't own dogs and so they maybe see dogs once in a great while or their experiences with dogs have been with just very friendly very outgoing social dogs that are great with children and then they think that's the norm and so they go into their, they think that, all right, the sixth or seventh dog I meet is going to be just the same as the first five. And then that's when they get into trouble mm -hmm. um, or they can, they've been able to hug or lay down on or take the food away or bones or mm -hmm. toys away from the first five. But the sixth dog is where they get into trouble. So I think that culture of dogs being more prevalent in other societies in the outdoor spaces or in, in public is uh, affecting human behavior as well when you think about it. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So we, yeah, we learn all the time also. It's not, uh, our behavior changes also. And uh, yes, I think because like kids are, as you said, sometimes are not exposed to dogs. And if the dogs are in a public places, then you need to know that sometimes you need to mind your food because they're gonna steal it. <laughs> and sometimes it's better to avoid interaction. And not every dog is just a cute teddy bear you can go and hug. Right. Uh, yeah, this is funny. He's mentioned that food. That's my, my son learned how to really uh, watch his food when my Doberman was around. <laughs> <laughs> he was an expert food stealer. <laughs> so, yeah. It, and he got used to doing that with all, just all dogs. He was very, very good. When we were fostering a lot of dogs, he used to be very good at protecting his food because he learned <laughs> all the food. This is what can happen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes yeah, so yes so dogs are yeah, the, dogs are teaching us and we are teaching dogs to sum up everything and our conversation it's like we learn all the time and they learn all the time yes yeah, so it's it's all a lot of it's predicated on culture, mm. culture. yes so, and culture changes the environment so it changes the behavior yes, yes. and uh we can all learn from each other actually and take some things we we may use in our culture from a different places we visit we learn from yes yeah i'm uh and i'm looking forward to it. i'm doing a lot of traveling next year this later this year next year to different countries so i'm gonna take my camera with me and do a lot of filming wonderful and, where are you traveling uh next stop is mexico uh, monterey mexico and then off to bogota colombia uh, and then to Chile again, and then um, back to Mexico again. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, so many, many options for stray dogs culture. Yes, yes. Oh, and I would love to see some videos later. Yeah, I will definitely share. Uh, <laughs> wonderful. Thank you so much for doing this, and um, I really appreciate it. Uh, you're welcome. It's, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you guys for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Make sure you send us your feedback and make sure you visit trompla.com. Especially that recently we had a first anniversary. I'm super proud because Trompla 
is one year old. It's been a wonderful year. I am really grateful for all your support and you are creating Chrome Law with us instructors. And this has been really a terrific 12 months already. And I hope it's just the beginning. I hope we will continue to create this wonderful community of Trumplo students around the world. So make sure you visit trumplo.com and see what brand new courses we offer this term. See you in the next episode.